الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اليوم اكملت لكم دينكم واتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الاسلام دينا صدق الله العظيم this verse of the Quran that I recited before you is a very powerful verse. It's such a powerful verse that a Jewish man once heard this verse being recited and he said to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an that had I or had we the Jewish community been given a verse similar to this, we would have made the day of its revelation a day of celebration. Such a powerful verse that if we were given a verse like this in our book, we would have made the day of its revelation a day of celebration. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an responded back by saying, We know exactly when this verse is revealed. We know exactly what day it was, where the Prophet was. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was in Hajj and he was here. He described everything. But he said, We do not make this verse a, its day of revelation, a day of celebration, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not teach us to do so. Now from this particular narration, what you learn is that this is a very powerful verse. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is announcing the completion of religion. That this is now a certified complete product. Today I have completed for you your religion. Now I want you to imagine for a second what kind of joy is the Prophet ﷺ experiencing at this moment. You know, less than 90 days left before he passes away. Less than 90 days left for the Prophet, roughly 90 days left for the Prophet ﷺ to pass away. And 23 years of great struggle. And for you to truly appreciate what this verse meant for the Prophet ﷺ, you kind of have to go back to the first day of revelation. Where the Prophet ﷺ is sitting in cave Hira. And Jibreel ﷺ comes to him and he says to him, Iqra, ya Muhammad, read. And this is the most important moment in the history of mankind, in the history of the creation. That the Prophet ﷺ is being given prophethood. Every prophet told their community that the Prophet Muhammad would come. And the most significant moment is the revelation of the Prophet ﷺ, the first revelation. And Jibreel ﷺ is giving the crown of revelation to the Prophet ﷺ, Iqra, read. And the Prophet ﷺ responds back very innocently, Ma ana biqari, I'm not one who reads. And many scholars, they say when he was saying this statement, what he was actually saying was that, I'm not ready for revelation yet. I need a little bit more time for preparation. I've been preparing for this day for 40 years. I need a little bit more time. And Jibreel salam hugs the Prophet and says, no, now is the time. And he squeezes him. And a spiritual transfer occurs from one heart to another. And he squeezes him so tight that the Prophet wasallam said in the hadith while describing that moment, that I thought I was going to die. Then he released him. And he said, Muhammad, iqra, read. And the Prophet a second time, he said, Ma'ana biqari, I need more time. And the Quran's revelation is such a powerful moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he himself says, Law anzalna hadha al-Quran ala jabal, la ra'aytahu khashi'an mutasaddi'an min khashiyatillah. That if we were to reveal this Quran on a mountain, that mountain would crumble. And now this Qur'an is being revealed onto the heart of a human being. And the second time the Prophet says, I can't read, he squeezes the Prophet so tight that the Prophet said, I thought I was going to die. And the spiritual transfer is occurring from one heart to another and then he releases him. You know, some scholars, they say, there's a discussion among scholars, that when you hug someone, do you go to the right or do you go to the left? Have you guys ever found yourself in an awkward position where you're going to hug someone and you're not sure which side you're supposed to go on? This is actually something different amongst the scholars. Some scholars say that following the sunnah of going to the right, everything should be with the right. So when you shake someone's hand with the right, anything good you do, you should go towards the right. So under that spirit, they say that when you hug someone, you go to the right side. And the other group of scholars, they say, no, when you hug someone, you should allow the hearts to touch, and therefore go to the left side. Both opinions are there on this issue. So he squeezes the Prophet wasallam a second time, and the Prophet wasallam expressed that moment by saying that I thought I was going to die. And he released him. And then he's repeated it a third time. And after this incident of the first revelation is over, the Prophet ﷺ descends from the mountain 
and he's kind of shooken up. You know when something really big happens in your life? You know that moment where you're given a trophy, or you've just won a competition, or you've just done something very good? At that moment, you're just so excited that your hands are actually shaking. Have you guys ever experienced that? That moment after, you're just lost for words, your jaw is shaking a little bit, and your hands are shaking, you're a little worried. And he comes to his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, and he informs her of the full revelation of what happened. And she takes her blanket and covers him. And at that moment, you're thinking to yourself, the Prophet sallallahu has just been given the crown of revelation. And the greatest responsibility ever to be given to a human being was just given to him. And all the other prophets that came, their scope was their community. But for the Prophet sallallahu the vision of his da'wah is the entire humanity. Now this person must be thinking, now where do I go? What do I do? How, what happens now? I'm the Prophet and Allah has praised me and everyone's been waiting for this, now what happens? And he's sitting there and he's sitting with his wife and it's just a husband and wife sitting side by side. She tells him, I believe you and he says, I'm a Prophet. You know, sometimes if you just think about that moment for a second, it really hits home. You think to yourself that when he tells her that I'm the Prophet, she must be thinking, you know, now what happens? You know, if I was to tell my wife that I'm the prophet and go to her, she would say, the guy's gone cuckoo, tomorrow I'll have to book an appointment with the psychiatrist. But look how much trust she has for the Prophet right? She says, you are a prophet. There's no doubt in it at all. And what's going to happen next? We'll think about that soon. There's two of them. Now I want you to fast forward 23 years. And Allah is revealing an ayah, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ O Muhammad, you have succeeded. And you've done such a great job that we have successfully revealed everything that needed to be revealed onto you. Today we have completed your religion for you. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And Allah says, I have showered upon you all the bounties that need to be given to the human beings until the Day of Judgment. Everything you and I are ever going to need, Allah says, وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي I have finished showering all my bounties upon you. And then at the end of it, وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ and that religion, that complete religion, that complete bounty is Islam. And this verse, the revelation of this verse, the scholars say, is one of the first signs of the Prophet ﷺ passing away. After the Prophet ﷺ, this verse is revealed, he realized that now his purpose in the world was over. The Prophet ﷺ, he then gathered the Sahaba together and he said to them, Oh my companions, watch me very carefully how I perform my hajj. Because after this year, I won't do hajj again. And the Sahaba were shocked. They had never heard the Prophet ever making a statement like this that he was going to leave them. And that reality never hit them. And he said to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He favored us. And how He favors us is by giving us the opportunity to belong to the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu To allow us to belong to the legacy of Al-Islam. And today as we're sitting here in this gathering, the reality is that many of our men and young women are struggling with finding and identifying themselves. It's one of the biggest struggles growing up in the West. You don't know who you are. You don't know where you belong. Do you belong to the Indian, Pakistani, African, Middle Eastern culture that your parents came from? Do you belong to the Western culture that you're growing up in? Or do you belong to the religion that you're constantly being pulled towards every time you come for Jummah Salah? And there's this triangular force that's pulling you in each direction, one direction here, one direction there, one direction there. And you're not sure how do you, how do you bring everything together? How does everything make sense? When I go back home, my mom and dad tell me that being African is the most important thing. Being Indian is the most important thing. That's what matters. Culture matters more. When I come to the West, I tell my parents, mom and dad, I love your culture, but the reality is that I'm American too. I was born here. I grew up here. And no matter how much you try to shelter your kids from American culture, the truth is that they're going to get exposure to it. Unless you somehow get rid of the TV, somehow get rid of the internet, somehow get rid of their cell phones, somehow get rid of every possible mode of communication that exists, in which case you're probably going to have a child who's sitting on a mine who's going to explode any second. You know, you can't restrict them so much because they're just going to... First, internally they'll implode, then they'll explode as well. You have to learn to give people their freedom. And when you give them their freedom, they're going to be exposed to the culture that you may like or dislike. Now, right here I want to make one clarity. When we talk about Western culture, many people immediately think that something negative, they think something bad is being talked about. 
Western culture isn't entirely bad, by the way. Do you guys understand that? There are certain aspects of Western culture that are not appropriate and they're wrong. But in all honesty, and this may be the bitter pill to swallow, but the truth is that there are certain things that the Western culture offers that are truly phenomenal, that are very beautiful. And the truth is that many Muslim countries need to learn to adopt these Islamic values from non-Muslims who have adopted them a lot better than you and I have, or our countries have, or the Muslim world has. I was in Hajj not too long back, earlier this year. And uh, I was standing at the airport, and I bumped into, you guys probably know Sheikh Omar Suleiman, maybe you guys know him, you know, famous scholar from, uh, he teaches for Al-Bayna these days, also Mishkat and also for Al-Maghrib. So we were standing at the airport, we bumped into each other, so we were talking to each other at the airport. This is in Jeddah. And we were leaving for, leaving Hajj coming back to the US. So we were sitting there talking, and as we were talking, this guy cuts in front of us. So I said to the guy, excuse me, that's the back of the line. He goes, Aish line, khalli. Which line are you talking about? Leave it alone. I said, no brother, that's the line right there. We've been waiting for a long time. You need to go to the back of the line. And this guy got angry and he snorted at me. Get out of my face. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, if this guy was standing in the US and he was to cut me in the line on the way to Dunkin' Donuts, this guy probably would be in a lot of trouble. Are you guys following what I'm saying? There's a concept of discipline. There's a concept of mercy. I was inside a car once we were traveling. This is another Muslim country. And while we were traveling, I finished off my, uh, my drink. So I said to the brother, can I put this, the empty cup by my feet? When I get out of the car, I'll throw it away. He got angry, said, no, give it to me right now. So I gave it to him. You won't believe what he did. Yeah, you guys already know. You guys know this guy? <laughs> he rolled his window and he tossed it out. I said, brother, what are you doing? He said, no, no, that garbage can't be in my, inside my car. It's going to be outside. And you think to yourself, this is what we as Muslims should have been contributing. You know the prophetic model in the West? We've made it very self-centric. So whatever of the deen serves me as an individual, serves you as an individual, we adopt that. But the things that don't serve us or our lowly desires, we completely trash that part of the religion. When in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that your religion is a complete religion. There are certain parts of your religion that are beautiful, that you need to adopt into yourselves. And there are certain parts that are still beautiful, but you that you may inherently already have them in you. Some things may be in you because your culture understands them, but then there are certain things that your culture may not understand. So when you bring all of this together, your American culture, your back home, you know, Indian, Pakistani, African, whatever culture you come from, and bring Islam together, you have to realize that no matter whichever culture you're a part of, the truth is that culture, you know, it's something that's limited to a place and a time. It's limited. So the culture that we have in, uh, in America, it's actually, even it might be a little bit, but it's different from the culture in Canada. Would you guys agree? Some differences. And the culture between England and America, different or not? Very different. I don't under, the toughest thing when I go to the UK is doing wudu there. It's very tough. Do anyone know why it's so hard doing wudu there? For some reason, when you go to their sinks, they have a different tap for hot water, different tap for cold water. So you turn on the cold water, your hand freezes, you turn on the hot water, your hand's on fire. And it's such a mushkila, such a difficulty. I remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam: "Isbagh al wudhuhi wudhu al makareh." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "One of the things that will cause the limbs to shine on the day of judgment will do will be to do wudhu when it's difficult." And I was like, "England guys, they're gonna, their limbs are going to be shining on the day of judgment." Okay. Such a cultural difference. Something as small as taps. You know, should you be riding? We drive our cars on the right side. They drive their cars on the Left side. Now, by principle, who's right? Walillah alhamd. Right? I mean, everything's supposed to be on the right side. The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahabi that when you walk on the street, walk on the. It's in the hadith, by the way. I'm just saying. Okay. So the culture is different. You go to you go to the Middle East, go to India, Pakistan, go to Africa. You know, within America, the truth is that it's different. You know, um, how uh, Bostonians speak is very different from how Chicagoans speak. Would you guys agree? You go to New York, the pizza is very different from the pizza in Chicago, right? Um, people have different sports they have interest in. The point that I'm making is that culture, first of all, is restricted to a space. And technically, not technically, but common, very generally speaking, culture is usually the best practices passed on from one generation to the next. So whatever the best practices were for that particular time, for that particular climate, for that society, one generation passed that to the next, and a little refining from one generation to the next, a few generations down, that becomes a common culture of that particular area. Now, not only is it restricted to space, 
it's also restricted to time. So the culture of America 100 years ago, is it the same as today's culture? Yes or no? Different? Very different, right? You, look at, you watch a movie from 100 years ago and watch a movie today, or even a movie shot today, but depicting something that happened 100 years ago, and you'll see just the garments are very different. Just the language is very different. The way people, this are, they're a lot more cultured. People are more cultured. And today, probably, they're not as cultured. So culture overall is restricted to space and time. It doesn't make it bad, but you have to realize it's man-made and therefore faulty. Everything that's man-made is faulty. That's an accepted fact right there. However, religion is divine. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything that's divine can never ever be faulty. It's not possible. Because it's divine. It's by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing, that when it comes to religion and Islam in particular, it's not restricted to a space, an area, a country, or a land. It's universal. And it isn't restricted to a time. It's until the, it's till the day of judgment. So we have to realize that our religion is one that is without boundaries. We can take our religion and walk with it in the four corners of the world and be proud about it. So you know, the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that yes, no, okay, let's come back to the original verse, then we'll come back to where I am. The verse has started off with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have chosen for your religion, Islam as a deen. And the word deen, usually when we translate it, we translate it as religion. But religion commonly connotates worship. So when I say Islam, what comes to your mind? A hat, a hijab, a beard, a jilbab, a sajda, a Qur'an, right? These are things that come to your mind because when we think of religion, immediately the masjid comes to our mind. A sheikh comes to our mind. Someone really overweight comes to our mind. Someone very angry comes to our mind. Someone who's anxious comes to our mind. Right, I'll, I'll plug it in. Talking about overweight. You know Imam Shafi says something very beautiful. He said, مَا رَأَيْتُ سَمِينًا قَدْتُ فَقِيهًا إِلَّا Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani Imam Shafi'i used to say, I have never seen an, over, an overweight jurist in my life other than Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. He was the only one. Other than him, all of my other teachers, they were very healthy people. And the reason why they say this is because قَلْبٌ سَلِيمٌ فِي جِسْمٍ سَلِيمٌ It's a famous Arabic, Arabic, Arabic proverb. Which means a sound heart exists in a sound body. Who had the most sound heart from the Ummah? The Prophet Do you think, do you agree that he had a sound body? Very healthy. You know, the Sahaba are describing him. And he's not young, he's old now. He's an older man. And they say he was healthy. You know, one of the first descriptions that we have of the Prophet Wasallam's physical body is a narration by Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha. You guys know who Umm Ma'bad is? Any of the sisters? Raise your hand if you know who Umm Ma'bad is. Yes? Yes, so she, she shared the story with her sister. May Allah reward her immensely. I mean, Qulu Amin, guys. I mean, very beautiful answer. So, Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha, for those of you who didn't hear, I'll try to relate that uh, beautiful story she said in, uh, over the mic for you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was in route to, in route to Medina Munawwara. They were in migration. And at one point, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa became very hungry. And he said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, I need something to eat, I'm hungry. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, let me figure it out. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was not generally one who complained about hunger. He didn't complain. He could be hungry for days on end and he wouldn't tell anyone. There's a narration of Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha. One day she knocked on the door of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa opened the door and his daughter Fatima was standing there. She had a piece of bread in her hand. He asked her, what are you doing here? She said, today my husband brought some food home and I made four breads. One for my husband, one for my, each of my son, and this is my fourth one. When I sat down to eat it, I thought to myself, maybe my father's hungry, let me share with him. So she asked him, oh my father, would you like to share my piece of bread with me? And the Prophet wasallam said to her that I haven't had a morsel to eat in three days. And both father and daughter sit down together and they share one dry piece of bread, half piece of bread each. Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. 
So the Prophet tells Abu Bakr that I'm hungry. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh says, Oh Messenger of Allah, let me figure it out. What he did was, he saw there was a lady, she had some animals, he went to the lady and said, can we have some milk from these animals? She said, the animals are dry, but if you can get any milk out of it, it's yours. The Prophet sallallahu called for the animal, the animal was brought to the Prophet sallallahu He took his blessed hand and rubbed it on the side of the animal and said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. She had no idea who he was or what kind of barakah she was going to experience or what that Bismillah meant or how much barakah there was in the side of that hand. He says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and milk begins to gush. The Prophet sallallahu fills one bowl and what does he do with it? What would you do? You're very hungry, you're in the middle of the desert and you just have a bowl of milk. What would you do? You would devour it, right? <laughs> Jump inside. What, is she, what does he do? He thinks to himself that if I'm hungry, imagine how hungry she must be. Her animals are dry. He says to Abu Bakr, give her first. Ladies first. Look, this is our deen. And she drinks. Then after that, the Prophet ﷺ shares with everyone. He drinks at the end himself. After he drinks, he fills up one more bowl and gives it to her and says, save this for later on. And they continue on with their journey. A little while later, her husband Abu Ma'bad comes home. He sees the milk and he says, where did this milk come from? We didn't have any earlier on. Where did this come from? So she said, well, this man came and he did this Bismillah thing and he, here's the milk. So her husband said, describe him to me. This is one of the first physical descriptions we have of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha was an artist. And her canvas was her poetry and her paintbrush were her words. And she begins to paint a, poet, a, a portrait of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Ali radiallahu anha has a narration, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anha has a narration. And a conglomerate of these narrations, they say that the man wasn't too tall, he wasn't too short, he was medium height. His body wasn't so wide that you would think he was obese, neither was he so thin you would think he's anorexic. He had a medium build. His skin wasn't so white that you would think he was sick, neither was it so dark that you would think he spent too much time under the sun. It was white with a red tone to it. You know the skin tone that people are trying to get while they're burning themselves on Miami Beach? Our Prophet was born with it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The man when he walked, he was humble, yet there was command with his walk. It was as if the earth was pinned underneath his feet. Every step he took was meaningful. It was as if he was descending from a mountain where there was a fast pace, yet gravity had him lowered down out of humbleness. The Prophet wasallam, when he walked, um, يَمْشِي تَكَفُّؤًا He wouldn't walk on a part of his foot, the front, side, or back. يَمْشِي تَكَفُّؤًا Meaning he would walk on his entire foot. Every step would be his entire foot. And the Prophet wasallam, he did not have a flat foot, he actually had an arc inside his foot. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh says that his hand was very soft. Literally, his hand was soft. And you think to yourself, a person who had participated in how many battles? According to Bukhari, 27. According to Bukhari, how many battles? If you have a UFC fighter who's fought 27 fights in his career, do you expect his knuckles and hands to be soft or rough? Rough, right? You know, people get rough hands just by gift wrapping because of all the paper cuts you get, okay? And here, the Prophet ﷺ, so much physical activity, but his hands are soft. And this is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that the Prophet sallallahu his hand was very soft, his fingers were long. His shoulders were broad, which was a sign of being manly. And how old is he at this time, by the way? During Hijrah, how old is he? 53. We're not talking about a 25-year-old Prophet because that would be game over. We're talking about a 53-year-old Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is still game over, but it's a 53-year-old version of game over. Okay? Fifth, Prophet is 53 years old and he's gone through so much. You know, a person like him who's seen his mother die, you would expect all of his beauty to dissolve right there. He holds his child in his own hand while the child's dying. You would think his beauty would dissolve right there. He buried his most beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha. You would think his beauty would dissolve right there. He was present at the burial of his grandfather who was like a father to him, Abdul Muttalib. You would think his beauty would dissolve right there. He was there at the burial of his uncle Abu Talib who was like a father to him. You would think his beauty would dissolve right there. He was there the day Sumayya radiallahu anha was killed and she was the first lady to ever be martyred in Islam. You would think his beauty would dissolve right there. And I, I can keep going with this by the way, okay? But at the end of it, they're saying the Prophet sallallahu he was so beautiful and handsome. 
His shoulders were broad, and between his shoulders there was, a, there was a skin that protruded which had strands of hair on it, which was known as the seal of prophethood. Sawa as-sadri wal batn. His chest and stomach were in line. Think about that for a second. Do a quick muraqabah over that. Right? His chest and stomach were in line. These days, there's like a constant race going on. Sometimes the stomach's in lead, sometimes the chest is in lead. And I was once in the UK and I got invited for dinner. And in our Indian culture, there is a practice that after dinner, we serve tea. So they were serving tea, and this is the funniest thing I saw in my life, I kid you not. We were drinking tea, and this uncle, in between the intervals, you know, the, during the intervals between his sips, you know, you know what he was using as an armrest for his tea? His stomach. This is not a joke. He took a sip and then put it right there. I said, uncle, isn't your stomach hot right now? That tea's hot. Doesn't it burn you? I've seen people do the most ajeeb things in the world. I was in Ramadan the other day in a, in a I'm not going to say where or when, but I, it was the month of Ramadan, and it was during Taraweeh prayer. I was leading, and I turned around after four rakah, and there was a brother in the front stuff. He saw some, he, he did something and I saw it, and I kid you not, it scarred me for the rest of my life. That had to be the most disgusting thing I've seen someone do in the masjid. He was flossing his teeth with his beard. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Flossing his teeth with his beard. Then he plucked it and flicked it. So I got up, I went to the brother and I said, Brother, whether I saw you or not, you should know Allah saw you doing that. And is this something that Islam teaches us? My teacher used to tell us that if you don't keep the house of Allah clean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not take care of your houses either. The love you give to the house of Allah, that attention will be given back to your house. The Sahaba, they say, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had the neck of a gazelle. His hair was long, and it was as if it was, it was so well oiled. The Sahaba, they say that when he saw the Prophet's hair, it's as if, you know, the look that a person has when they get out of the shower? You know that look when you get out of the shower, your hair's under control, the perfect time for a selfie? You know, his hair was so well maintained. And sometimes it came into his earlobes, which they called the Jumma. And at times they went beneath his earlobes, and this is what they called the Limma. And the longest the Prophet Wasallam's hair went was until his shoulder blades, which was known as the Wathra, the longer hair of the Prophet Wasallam. Wasi al Jabin. His forehead was very wide. His eyebrows were the shape of a bow. You know a bow and arrow? The shape of a bow. And they were dark strands of hair. His eyelashes were dark strands of hair, but they were longer. The white of his eye was very white, the dark of his eye was very dark, and when a person looked into the eyes of the Prophet wasallam, the eyebrows, the eyelashes, the white and the dark put together, you were lost in the beauty of the Prophet wasallam. His neck, his nose was long and it had a lift at the end, and it was as if there was a light emitting from there. Lahu nurun ya'aluhu. There was like a light emitting from the nose of the Prophet wasallam. His cheeks didn't bulge, neither were they sucked in, they were straight. The Prophet's beard covered the upper part of his chest and distributed between his beards and beard and his hair, head. He had no more than 17 to 18 strands of gray hair at the age of 60. Go find me a 25-year-old man who doesn't have gray hair these days. They're hiding it somewhere inside. Right? Everyone's hiding their hair. Okay. 30-year-old man, find me someone. Today our 30 year old men are complaining of hair loss. I know a part of it's genetics, so I give you a cut on that, I have some myself. But a part of it is that we don't take care of ourselves, we eat whatever it is. The point that I'm trying to make to you my friends, actually let me finish off the description, because since we've done it, why not finish it off? The Sahaba, they say the Prophet wasallam, when he smiled, everyone in the gathering would smile. His teeth were like white pearls placed perfectly next to one another. And the, he, when he spoke, there was a beautiful fragrance that emitted from his mouth. His saliva was sweetness for the water of Medina Manohra. The Sahaba, they said, a Messenger of Allah, the water in Medina is bitter. Can you please fix this? So he doesn't take a bucket of Kool-Aid and dump it in there. He just puts a drop of his saliva in there. Water fixed. It's sweet now. The Prophet ﷺ's saliva was a cure for the one who was ill. Ali radiallahu anh, during the battle of Khaybar said, O Messenger of Allah, my eyes hurting. I can't be the leader of the army. The Prophet ﷺ said, you will be the leader of the army. He said, O Messenger of Allah, my eyes hurting though. The Prophet said, come here. Let's perform laser surgery on you. No follow-up, no review, no insurance, no need for feedback, just come here. And he takes it, puts saliva on his eye. Ali radiallahu anh says, the other one used to hurt, but this one never ever hurt me again. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wasn't a miserly person, he was a very beautiful person. He was a person that smiled very abundantly. The Sahaba, they say that when you sat with the Prophet, you felt comfortable. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would smile, like I said, everyone in the gathering would smile. And he would smile at jokes. 
If someone said a joke to him, he would sit down and smile at it. A person came to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, once went on a journey for business and he had two Sahaba with him. The three of them went on a journey. And during their journey, there was one Sahabi who was responsible, who was responsible of distributing the food amongst the three. The second Sahabi was responsible of being the guide. The third one was Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. They traveled for some business. They were stationed in a city. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh had gone somewhere. The two of these were together. One said to the other, give me some food. He said, I can't give you any food until Abu Bakr comes back. So the other Sahabi said to him, give it to me now, otherwise I'll take it. He said, do whatever you want, I'm not going to give it to you. He said, do whatever I want, now you're in trouble. So he went to the market and told the people there, everyone gather around, everyone gather around. The people gathered around, what's wrong? He said, I have a slave for sale, very cheap, 10 bucks only, Black Friday. So the people said, really? So cheap, why so cheap? He said, the problem is, there's only one problem with the slave. He just doesn't remember he's a slave. They said, no problem, once he's in chains and working in the fields, who cares if he remembers or not? So they, he bought them nearby, he said, that guy right there. They went and they arrested him. He said, I'm not a slave. They said, we knew you were going to say that. Yalla, let's go. And they were taking him. He said, wait for my other companion. He can prove that I'm not a slave. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh came, fixed the situation. This guy was having a meal on the other side. You know, they returned back to Medina. So the Sahabi who was pranked, he said that I'm going to make a complaint to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to tell the Prophet, you did this to me. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed of the incident, what did he do? He started laughing. And Umm Salama radiallahu anha says that anytime anyone mentioned that Sahabi's name, the Prophet would laugh at that, even until the point there were just a few days left for him to pass away, and someone mentioned that Sahabi's name, and the Prophet started smiling again. What we forget to realize is the Prophet ﷺ was a human being. He wasn't just a human being, he was a very beautiful human being. And sometimes when we talk about the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, we end up dehumanizing them. We make them beyond human beings. The Prophet ﷺ was the best human being. He was ma'asum, he was protected by Allah. These are all agreed upon issues. But the point is, at the end of the day, the Prophet ﷺ was still a human being. The Prophet ﷺ experienced emotions. And his emotions were very, very real. They weren't false. When the Prophet ﷺ's wife Khadija passed away, he became extremely sad. When his uncle Abu Talib passed away, he became very sad. When his son, Ibrahim passed away, the narration actually mentions the Prophet ﷺ was holding his own son in his hand and his son passed away. And the Prophet started crying and crying and crying. You can't ever imagine what it must be like to hold a child in your hand and see the child die. Can you imagine that for a second? For those of you who aren't parents, you have no idea. For those of you who have parents, you're probably making dua right now, Ya Allah, don't let me live to see that day. I don't want to live to see the day where I have to hold my child passing away. There was a... Khair, I won't share the story with you. We have so much more to cover. So, the Prophet ﷺ is holding his son and he's crying. And one Sahabi said, oh, Messenger of Allah, why are you crying? The Prophet said, why won't I cry? I love my son. And he said, وَإِنَّ عَلَى فِرَاقِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمْ مَحْزُونَ Oh, Ibrahim, he's speaking to his son. We are very sad that you left us today. And the Prophet ﷺ continued crying and crying and crying. He was a very real person. Prophet ﷺ, he experienced emotions. There was a time in the Prophet ﷺ's own marriage where there was a struggle. And there was a challenge the Prophet ﷺ faced in his own marriage. And that doesn't make the Prophet ﷺ bad in any way. That just proves how much more beautiful he was. That with the challenges, he always came on top. There was one instance in the Prophet's marriage where the situation became so difficult, so difficult, that there was a separation. The Prophet separated from his wives. And not only for one or two days, for almost 40 days. How many days? That's a very tense moment. When a husband and wife are separated, that's tense. 40 days? You can't imagine how tense it was. The Sahaba, they say during that period, the Prophet ﷺ even stopped smiling. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he knew what emotions were. Anas bin Malik comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, O Messenger of Allah, my younger brother is sad. He's depressed. The Prophet said, what happened? He said, my younger, bird, my, my younger brother had a bird and the bird died. So the Prophet said, okay, let's figure this out. So he sits down next to this young kid, whose name, you know, the scholars differ upon what was his name. He is known as Aba Umair in the hadith itself. The Prophet sits down, sits down next to this kid. Now you're thinking the Prophet of Allah is sitting next to a kid, and he's sitting next to a kid who lost a bird. 
That's something usually you and I would send someone else to do. The Imam wouldn't go himself for that. He would send someone else. Maybe like, you know, brother, can you take care of this? Can you take care of that? But the Prophet shows up himself. And you ask yourself why? And it was because the Prophet ﷺ had empathy. Two characteristics that must exist in a person to be successful in their da'wah. What are the two? Empathy and sympathy. These two characteristics, if you have them, Allah will open the doors of da'wah for you. But if you lack and if you lack in these two things, Allah inshallah will give you barakah, but you're, there's gonna be barriers there. And the Prophet empathized. How does he empathize with his child? Because he knew what it felt like being a young kid and losing someone you love. So he sits down next to the child and he wants to cheer him up. So how does the Prophet cheer him up? You know, if it was my dad or your dad and I lost a bird, what would dad say? Here's 10 bucks, go buy another bird. That's how, this, that's how the scenario would play out more or less, okay? Dad, no, not 10 bucks, the prices have gone up. Okay, 100 bucks, son, go take care of it. That's what would happen. The Prophet Wasallam realizes that this is not a money issue. Children don't need money, they need emotional support. And this kid needs to be emotionally cheered up. So he pulls off two tricks that are very important for cheering up kids. I have three sons at home. And whenever my sons are sad, I know that these are two things that if I do them, they're always going to get happy. No matter whatever there, whatever there is. The first thing, kids love to be addressed as adults. Yes or no? So if my son is sitting down and he's sad, I'll say, you know, big men like you don't cry. He'll say, yeah, you're your dad, right? I'm not crying anymore. You know? He wants to sleep next to me in the bed. I'll say, beta, big boys like you sleep in their own beds. So he'll say, yeah, you're right, dad. I have to go sleep in my own bed now. So you know, they like being treated as adults. They don't like being treated as kids. So the Prophet Sallallahu uses that tactic and rather than calling him Umayr, he calls him Ya Aba Umayr. Oh, father of Umayr, treating him like an adult. Because that's how adults were referred to. The second thing that always works to cheer up kids is a little rhyme. If you rhyme their names, they love it. Have you guys ever noticed that? Like when I was a kid, people used to call me Hussein is insane. I always laughed at it. I always laughed at that right there. If someone said Hussein was insane, I used to laugh. Insane in the membrane, I would laugh even more. Because rhyming is very cool for kids. So the Prophet says to him, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughayr. And he cheered up right away. The Prophet knew how to deal with people. And this was the most beautiful thing about him. He was a very real person. The Prophet Sallallahu yes, he had an aspect of him that was dedicated to his worship, but there was also an aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu life that was purely dedicated to his, um, to his interaction, people, his social interaction. The Prophet Sallallahu his worship is no secret to anyone. How did he worship? How the Prophet Sallallahu conducted himself in terms of his relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You know, Aisha radiallahu anha narrates a tradition, very famous narration. Imam, Imam um, Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi narrates this narration under the tafsir of the verse inna fi khalq samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilaf al wa nahari la ayati li ulil albab underneath the tafsir of that verse he narrates this incident Aisha radiallahu anha says that one night the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came home and he lied down next to me and she says we were so close to each other qad massa jildahu jildi that our skin actually made contact, very intimate. Then the Prophet wasallam said to me, Aisha, if I have your permission, I would like to spend this night with the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's such a beautiful statement. I find that statement beautiful for many reasons, but two things really stand out to me in this statement. The first thing is that he's lying down next to his wife, and what is he thinking of? Allah. And we're praying salah behind the imam, we're saying, Shaykh, hurry up, my wife is waiting for me. The exact opposite, right? Here he's next to his wife and he's thinking of Allah and here we are, and especially those guys that are not married yet, those girls that aren't married yet, only thing that's in their mind is nikah, 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 nikah. It's like a 24-hour clock. Nikah, nikah, nikah. And here the Prophet ﷺ, he's standing there and he's thinking of Allah. He's lying next to his wife, he's thinking of Allah. The second thing that's so beautiful about this narration is that he didn't just get up and leave. What did he do first? He asked for permission. Does the Prophet need permission from anyone? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If there was anyone who didn't need permission, who was it? It was the Prophet. But he teaches us something. That when it's family time, you don't just get up and leave because your friends are over, because you have to go party, because this, that, and the other, because you need to go pass out flyers for an event. I'm being honest with you. Family time is family time. And if you don't have a strong family, then the rest of it is all fluff. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addresses this issue, and he says to her, can I have your permission to go and pray? 
And Aisha radiallahu anha, she kept it real. That's one thing beautiful about her, she always kept it real. She said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I would like to spend this night with you. That's what I want. I want to spend the night with you. But I know you want to spend it with Allah, so what's going to make you happy will make me happy. Go and spend it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But she didn't say go. What did she start off by saying? What did she start off by saying? I want to spend the night with you. Aisha radiallahu anha, she cherished every moment with the Prophet. One night, the, the Prophet said, Aisha radiallahu anha was sleeping, and she woke up in the middle of the night, and the Prophet said, was gone. Now she got up and she was worried, where is the Prophet gone? So she woke up and she saw the Prophet was just leaving the house, so she secretly followed him. She was secretly following. And the Prophet ﷺ went to the graveyard. He stood there, he made dua. And after making dua, he came back. And he said to Aisha, you are following me, right? So Aisha Allah says, yes. Why were you following me? She said, I thought that maybe you went to one of the other wives and I thought that's not going to happen on my night. Amazing, look at this lady, keeping it so real, right? Not going to happen on my night. Anyone know which night this was, by the way? Which night was this? 15th of Shaban, very good. You know the story of the Prophet visiting the graveyard on the 15th of Shaban? You know who narrates that story? <laughs> Aisha radiallahu anha. And you know what she was doing at that time? She was secretly following the Prophet wasallam, and she saw him go to the graveyard. There's another narration that Aisha radiallahu anha woke up in the middle of the night and the Prophet wasallam wasn't there. So she kind of, she's like, where's the Prophet gone? So she stretched her heart, hand like this, stretching, and her hand went inside the masjid because that's where, you know, the house was attached. And she said it went through and she held the foot of the Prophet Oh, he's there, okay. Right? So she reached inside the masjid, she saw the Prophet's foot was there, she says, I touched the inner part of his foot and the Prophet was actually making a dua and she narrates that dua and then she pulled her hand back inside. So, Aisha radiallahu gives this response, O Messenger of Allah, I would like to spend the night with you but if you want to spend it with Allah, go ahead. So she says the Prophet got up, he started his prayer. And فَطَالَ قِيَامَهُ He stood for a very long period reading and reading and reading. When we read Salah, especially when it comes to Tahajjud, how quick is it? Two minutes. When does Fajr time end? 4.45? Okay, 4.50 or 4.40. Ya Allah, Bismillah. Two rakat very quickly. The Prophet said, his, his Qiyam became very long. And then, فَإِذَا سَجَدَ And then he began to cry. While he was standing, he cried and cried and cried. فَإِذَا سَجَدَ بَكَى And when he went into sajda, he started crying. حَتَّى بَلَّتِ الْأَرْضِ until the earth where he did sajda on, it became moist and wet. That patch became wet. You know, I always think to myself, imagine how lucky that earth was that it was soaked in the tears of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Akbar. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he finished off his prayer. After he finished his prayer off, she says, the Prophet came and lied down next to me again. And I didn't want to bother him because he was on this emotional moment. He was enjoying this emotional moment. So I sat there, quiet. I lied next to him quietly. He lied next to me, very emotional, just crying. Bilal radiallahu anh gave the adhan. It was a habit of Bilal radiallahu anh that he would come to receive the Prophet at his house. So he knocked on the Prophet's door. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa opened the door and he left for the prayer. While he was leaving for the prayer, Bilal radiallahu anh asked, O Messenger of Allah, why are you crying so much? Look at your face. So Aisha is hearing from inside. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, in this night there were some verses of the Quran revealed. And since these verses have been revealed, I've just been crying. And what were these verses? Anyone know? I told you these are the verses underneath which Imam Ibn Kathir narrated this incident. Which verse was that? Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilaf al-layli wa al-nahari la ayat li'ul al-albab. Alladhina yadhkuruna Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim. Alladhina yadhkuruna Allah qiyaman. The Prophet was standing and he was crying. Wa qu'udan, he was sitting down and crying. Wa ala junubihim and he was lying down and crying. Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ مَنْ تُدْخِلِ النَّارَ فَقَدْ أَخْزَيْتَ O oh, our Lord, whoever you destined to be sent to the fire of hell, that person has been disgraced. وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And there is no helper for such a person. You know, what a powerful dua. So the Prophet ﷺ's ibadah was known how he exerted himself, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, connecting himself with Allah. And the truth is that if that component of you is missing, that connection between you and Allah, then half of you is actually missing. Or more than that. 
Because you can't be an activist. You can't be that perfect activist. Let me use that. You can't be that person who's going to affect everyone unless you are spiritually strong yourself. This is one of the issues that we have. Today we have many people who are out there who are you know, doing so much khidmah, which is beautiful, which is great. I understand that's a very good thing. But internally they're hollow. So when someone asks them a question about Islam or a second or third question, they're lost for answers. When in reality, we need to develop ourselves first. That's the prophetic model. The Prophet wasallam he develops himself. He develops the Sahaba, and then they go to the world. And then they realize the person they were talking to, the person they were dealing with, he wasn't hollow from inside. You know when you listen to a lecture, or when you attend a gathering, and the person talking to you really doesn't know what they're saying, it only takes a few minutes for you to realize that. But when you sit with someone who's practiced, someone who's learned, someone who has tarbiyah done, someone who's sat at the feet of a scholar, someone who has a spirituality, like the Prophet wasallam, the Sahaba were influenced immediately by the Prophet wasallam. And for you and I to understand that when we bring the prophetic model to the West, that spirituality is equally important. The Sahabi comes to the Prophet wasallam, And the Prophet wasallam said to him, it's a long incident, long narration, I'm just going to summarize it for you. The Prophet wasallam said to the Sahabi, Ask me for whatever you want. Jackpot or not? Yes or no? Blank check. Ask me for whatever you want. You know, what would you and I say? I'd say I want a jet. So the TSA don't have to pat me down anymore. And everyone would have their own thing, right? What's the one thing that you really want? So the Prophet says to him, what do you want? You know, this guy said the best thing. That Sahabi said the best thing. He said, a Messenger of Allah, all I want is to be your buddy in Jannah. I want to be with you in Jannah. And the Prophet says, Awa ghayra dhalik, how about something else? He says, no, with you in Jannah. Awa ghayra dhalik, anything else? He says, the Messenger of Allah, trust me, I don't want anything. I just want to be with you in Jannah. If I know I'm going to be with you in Jannah, my purpose is served. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does he say to him? Anyone know? Yes. Ainni ala dhalika bi kathrat sujood He said, I can... In order for you to be my companion in Jannah, you have to make a lot of sujood. I'm going to make the dua, but you have to pray a lot. You keep praying to Allah and you're going to make it there. He doesn't just sign it off and say you're there. You get these ranks by dedicating. You become these people by giving first. You don't just become Abu Bakr Siddiq for the sake of it. Abu Bakr Siddiq was a giant, but internally he was a mountain. He was a man that was so skinny that Imam Bukhari narrates a hadith that his pants couldn't even sit on his waist. You guys know the famous narration, right? His pants would keep sliding down his waist because of how thin of a person he was. But when it came to his spirituality, he was a mountain. Because the Prophet ﷺ one day asked, who followed a funeral today? Who raises his hand? Abu Bakr. Who visited a sick person today? Who raises his hand? Abu Bakr. Who's fasting today? Who raises his hand? Abu Bakr. Everything. You know, it was a random day. Abu Bakr didn't know the Prophet was going to ask, but that ibadah was a part of him. And we have to give importance to this. You know, I'm not downsizing or speaking low of activism. I don't want anyone to think that. What I'm talking about though is the other side of it that is very commonly neglected. People believe that giving a lecture or being a part of a halaqa or starting up an organization is success. These are all means to ultimately connect with Allah. That's the purpose behind it all. You guys understand? All the seminars we do, all the programs we do, what's the reason behind it? It's so that people come and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would you guys agree with me? That's the purpose behind it, so that we can encourage one another to get closer to Allah. As Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا عَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ فِي خُسْرِ Mankind isn't lost, but for those who have four things, what are they? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا What's number two? They do good deeds. It's a part of us. You can't deny that reading Qur'an isn't important. It is important. It's so important that you don't understand how important it is. You know, it's said regarding Sa'id bin Jubair. Sa'id bin Jubair, who was a great, great tabi'i. He was killed at the hands of Hajjaj bin Yusuf, which is another story for itself. He was known for being one of the greatest mufassideen. He had a very special connection with the Qur'an. He was granted permission to go inside the Kaaba and pray two rakah. He was granted permission as an honor to go in the Kaaba and pray two rakah. You know what he did? Anyone know? When he started his two rakat, in the first rakat, he read the full Qur'an. <laughs> what a guy, man. What an awesome guy. He got up, he's like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to get another chance like this. Let me just bust out the full Qur'an. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> he just went on, he just kept going. He read the full Qur'an in one rakat. And I wouldn't be surprised if the second rakat, he read it again. But the point being is that these are people who are very connected. 
These are people that were spiritual. You know, there's a famous narration which um, is known as the narration of the glad tidings of 10 companions who are promised Jannah. Have you guys heard of this narration before? The Prophet wasallam. the Sahabi says, one day I was sitting with the Prophet wasallam, and the Prophet wasallam said, there are 10 Sahaba to go to Jannah. Who are they? Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah, Talha fil Jannah, Sa'ad fil Jannah, Sa'id fil Jannah, Zubair fil Jannah, Abdurrahman fil Jannah, Abu Ubaidah fil Jannah. That's nine. So the narrator, the person who heard the hadith, he said to the narrator, but you said ten, that's only nine. He said, oh, forget the tenth person, he's not important. He said, no, he is. We need to know who the tenth person is. You said nine only, but you said initially there's ten people. He said, no, 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 forget it. Just, that's enough for you. He said, no, who's the ninth person? So he said, Sa'id fil Jannah. The tenth person is me. I just didn't want anyone else to know. Now if you study the biography of these ten companions, Sa'id bin Zaid is someone that not too many people know about. Even if you read the biographies, if I ask someone here, someone tell me one thing about Sa'id bin Zaid, tell me. One thing. I'm not surprised by the way, okay? I wasn't expecting it. Even if you read in the books of biography, you won't find much about him. He's one of the ten promised Jannah, Sa'id bin Zaid. I'll just tell you one thing about him, so in the future, if someone ever asks you this question, you don't feel this bad, okay? One thing about Sa'id bin Zayn. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an wakes up in the morning very angry and intending to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He's on the way to kill the Prophet, he meets this guy on the way there, and they have a duel. You know who that was? It wasn't Sa'id bin Zayd. <laughs> Everyone thought it was him, no it wasn't him. Then he, that person says to Umar bin Khattab, that go to your sister's house. He goes to his sister's house, Fatima is there, and his, his sister Fatima bint al-Khattab, her husband, and another Sahabi were there. And that Sahabi was their teacher. He came inside, barges in, and he beats up his brother-in-law and his sister, and there was one Sahabi hidden in the closet. Anyone know who that was? That wasn't Sayyid bin Zayd either. <laughs> now you're thinking, who is Sayyid bin Zayd? It was the other guy he beat up his brother-in-law. He was married to Fatima bint al-Khattab. It was Umar radiallahu anhu's brother-in-law, Sa'id bin Zayd. And it's so crazy because a few years ago, Umar beat the daylights out of him, and now he's telling him, you're going to Jannah, and so am I. And the reason why, and Sa'id bin Zayd actually prohibited his wife from telling anyone. He said to her, that if anyone asks you anything about me, don't tell them. She said, why? He said, because I, I don't want people to feel intimidated by the amount of ibadah I do. It was known that you would never see Sa'id bin Zayd between Fajr and Dhuhr. You know what he was doing? He wasn't sleeping. Most of the young guys are thinking, that's what I do. Between Fajr and Dhuhr, I sleep on Saturday and Sunday. Sa'id bin Zayd wasn't sleeping. He used to pray Salah for majority of the time. Every single day. How many hours is that? Six hours, seven hours, more or less, you know? So much time. These were people who had their spirituality on lockdown. So the first aspect, and this is a very important aspect, and I don't want anyone, think, anyone here to belittle it at all. You need to learn to dedicate some time for your own spiritual development. You can't walk away, you can't ignore it. There was a great scholar in Islamic history by the name of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Very good. Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Anyone know his real name? I love testing my students by the way. I don't mean this in a bad way, just so you learn. What was Imam Ghazali's real name? Ah, very good, Muhammad. The Prophet wasallam said in a hadith, Sammu bi ismi, name your kids after me. So it's always been a tradition that people have named their kids after the Prophet wasallam. There was one brother who I met, he was African. I said, what's your name? He said, Muhammad al thamin I said, what? You know what Muhammad al thamin means? That means he has eight brothers, seven brothers, and they're all called Muhammad. Muhammad al thamin means he has seven other brothers before him. I don't know if there's like a Tasya and Ashir and... You know, I don't know how many are after that, but Thamin means the eighth, which means that there are seven other brothers that he has that are called Muhammad. Now imagine, Muhammad, idaraw. Muhammad, come here. <laughs> Everyone stands up, right? It's a beautiful thing. People used to name their, and it was a big, it was a tradition among scholars too. They would name their kids Muhammad. Uh, anyone know Imam Bukhari's real name? Muhammad, very good, right? That was Imam Bukhari's real name, right? Anyone, anyone disagree here? It's Imam Bukhari's real name, okay? What was Imam Shafi'i's real name? Muhammad. Imam Ghazali's real name was? His actual name, his birth name, was Muhammad. And it was very common that if the first child was named Muhammad, the second child's name would be? Ahmad. Very good. So Imam Ghazali's younger brother's name was? Ahmad al-Ghazali. Muhammad al-Ghazali, Ahmad al-Ghazali. These are two brothers. 
I actually made this intention too. I said, Ya Allah, if you bless me with a son, I'm going to name him Muhammad. Allah blessed me with a son, I named him Muhammad. I said, Ya Allah, if you bless me with a second son, I will name him Ahmad. Allah gave us a second son, I named him Ahmad. We found out we were expecting a third son. My wife said, now, who are you, well, now what are you going to name him? So I made a lot of dua and I, um, I went through many biographies, many books at home. I went through them, you know, reading different biographies and trying to look for a name. And I couldn't come to a conclusion. So I was in Umrah and I was in Riyadh al-Jannah, which is known as the area, the Garden of Paradise. And I was in Sujood and I made dua to Allah, Ya Allah, give me a name to name my son because the name is very important. It's a very important part of a child's life. What should I name him? So I kid you not, I finished my salah. I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And there was a poster right there. It said, Muhammad Ahmad Hamid Mahmoud. <laughs> I took a picture of it and I immediately WhatsApped it to my wife. I said, look, Allah gave the answer right here. And by the way, that, that frame is still there. If anyone of you guys, I hope nobody nicked it, but if it's still there, you can go and check it out yourself. Not here, in Medina Manawara. <laughs> Muhammad Ahmad Hamid Mahmoud. Then there are others as well, Hamid, Hamoud, Hamad. For girls, Hamida, Mahmuda, Hamida. Right? Attached to the idea of Hamd. So Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, his name was Muhammad, his brother's name was Ahmad. So Imam al-Ghazali was a, this is a very important, after this point, I'll give you guys a break. Let me just finish off this one point, then we'll take a break, okay? Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, was one of the greatest scholars of his time. He was so knowledgeable. Allah had blessed him with so much knowledge that at a very young age, he became the celebrity. At a very young age. Most scholars, Allah gave them fame after they died, not during their life. You guys understand that? Most scholars became famous after they... After, while they were alive, they didn't have the fame. And that was a blessing from Allah, so their sincerity was maintained. Matan Abi Shuja'a, for those of you... Have any, has, have any of you guys ever read that book or heard of it? Matan Abi Shuja'a, a very famous book in the Shafi'i Fiqh. It's one of the primary books they teach. The book was authored by a man who used to work in the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a cleaner there. And he told his buddies that I'm working on a project. They're like, what kind of project are you working on? He's a worker, you know, just cleaning guy. He said, I'm working on a something. When I pass away, you'll see it. When he passed away, they went through his belongings, they found the book, and they said, oh my God, this guy was such a big scholar, and he was cleaning the mosque like a low-life person? I mean, not to degrade those who clean the mosque of the Prophet, but you know, he was a person that should have had a big following. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are many scholars, most scholars didn't have fame while they were alive. There are very few who had it. And Imam Bukhari was one of them. He had a lot of fame while he was alive. A lot of fame. And likewise, so was Imam Ghazali, one of them. At a young age, he became very famous. And he was actually given a government position because of his knowledge. His lectures were so well accepted that his books were widely sold and read during his lifetime. And the scholars benefited most from him. And I want you to think of Ghazali being the Twitter sensation, the Facebook celebrity. He had the most followers on Instagram, you name it. This, he had the most, this guy was a celebrity again. So what happened was that one day Imam al-Ghazali was giving a lecture and he noticed that all this knowledge he had, all this work he was doing, he felt empty internally. Because knowledge is supposed to ultimately develop you internally. That's the purpose behind it all. The khidmah you do, the masjids you build, the people you, everything you do is supposed to have a spiritual impact on you. That's the, it's like a circle, it brings it all back there. And he noticed that everything he was doing wasn't lifting him spiritually and it bothered him. And days went by and it bothered him more and more and more. Until Ghazali himself says in his autobiography, al Munqid Min Al-Dalal, that one day I sat down to give a lecture and all of my students were in front of me. And Allah took away from me the most valuable thing I had that made me a celebrity. Anyone know what it was? His speech. He couldn't talk anymore. He sat down, but this, this mil, he stopped right there. He couldn't speak anymore. Allah took away his speech from him. And everyone was shocked. And his brother Ahmad al-Ghazali came to him and said something very beautiful to him. And anyone other than Ahmad al-Ghazali would have said this, he would have got the smack down. But Ahmad al-Ghazali was his brother, so he got away with it. It's his brother, right? The younger brother came to him and said to him, his younger brother was a very spiritual person. He, he's contributed a lot to uh, Persian poetry and spirituality. So his brother came and said to him, listen to this carefully, how long will the stone sharpen blades while it remains dull itself? You guys understand that phrase, that statement? He's referring to Ghazali as a stone. When you want to sharpen a blade, what do you use? A stone. 
The stone sharpens all the blades, but at the end of it, does the stone become sharp itself? It's still dull. So he's saying to Ghazali, you've created so many scholars and so many great people, but look at you, you're a loser. And when he says this to him, Ghazali realizes that his words were right. And that's when he got up, he told his family, he resigned from his position, he went home, told his wife and children that I need to go for Hajj now. I need to change. And change starts with the Kaaba. He said, I need to go to Hajj. And he said, after Hajj, I'm going to come back after a little while. I need some alone time. And he goes for Hajj, and he comes back after 10 years. Ghazali was gone for 10 years. 10 years he was gone. And he comes back 10 years later. I can't even imagine what his wife went through, right? <laughs> 10 years later, he shows up. And now Ghazali is 2.0. You guys understand that? He's like a new upgrade now. And he's just like this beast who's really just tearing through it and really bringing perspective to everything. So the first thing that I want you guys to realize, when we talk about bringing the prophetic model to the West, it's important that we look at it holistically, not partially. And as we look at it holistically, one of the most important aspects of the da'wah of the Prophet the call of the Prophet, was the internal call, the call to the self. Now the second part of the da'wah, inshallah, we'll discuss after a short break. We'll take a break right now. How long do you guys need for a break? You don't take breaks? Oh, you should take a little break. I think I should take a little. Who's in charge here? I've seen the sister. You're in charge. So how long, how long do they need a break for? 10 minutes? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.